and the figure of 190. All right, Your Honor, okay. Glendora, yes, Your Honor, I just had that out here looking. I'm sorry. Judge, that's all right. Take your time. Glendora, I just had that out here to give to you. The court, you must know you arrived at the figures. Glendora, it would be $5.58 to file the action, and I believe I paid $2 for a subpoena. Those are the costs. What about the videotape, the $120? How do I get that? How did you arrive at that? Well, the stock is about, then it was about $8. The court, okay. The witness, then you have to go to a production house. First of all, you make the original. You made the original? I made the original. Where? The jokes were in front of the uh, Eastern Star uh, live audience. I made that. How much did that cost to make the original? I don't believe it is before the court, DeGiulio says. Judge, it is not before the court. Glendora, that would be the labor charge. I had to have it edited to condense it to 10 minutes. Once I had the master made, I had to make dubs and so on. My own tape, you would have heard that. My charge for the VHS was $120. That's what I was charged. That's my business expense. That's where it comes from. It is production costs and stock. Judge, okay. Glendora, it is $120. That's what you meant. I thought you meant how did I arrive at $190. I wanted to know how you arrived at $120, the judge says. I assume that the balance is the interest and cost and things of that nature. Glendora, yes, Your Honor, and I would like to uh, point out that at that time, WABC TV, Mr. Julio, note my objection, Your Honor. Judge, as to what? To Julio, she is going to stay here, say amounts. I know what she is going to say. Judge, I don't know that. I can't rule yet. Glendora, they charge $500 for a dub. Judge, that's not relevant to your case. Glendora, it's a good price. What I am thinking, $120 is really a cheap price. There is no fudging in it. Judge, do you have anything else that you want to add before I allow Mr. DiGiulio to cross-examine you? Glendora, thank you, Your Honor. One moment, please. Sure. Glendora, yes. I should like to add that Gelman refusing to come to the phone over a period of five years made it impossible for me to give testimony on what his office associates said in response to our request. DiGiulio, Your Honor, what is this? Objection to this. What is this? Uh, judge, it is a statement, okay? Is there anything else? Glendora, I want to just see if I have covered everything. Do you have any questions to ask me, Your Honor? Judge, I will wait until Mr. DiGiulio asks you questions, and then I will allow you to say anything other than what you have said, and then it, I will see if I have any questions. Glendora, thank you for my day in court. DiGiulio, Your Honor, normally I would have to make my formal motions, but recognizing this is somewhat of an informal proceeding. I will make the motion at the close of the plaintiff's case. However, I would like to move at this stage and thereafter, after the court rules or reserving on my motion, I would like to do my cross-exam. What did all that mean? There, was, there are several elements of this case, DeGiulio says, extensive elements of this case. We're on page 25 which is that Mrs. Buell has not proved her case. Apparently, it is the contention of the claimant in this matter that there, are some sort, that there was some sort of contract entered into between herself and my client, and in her direct testimony, all she stated was she spoke to Mr. Gelman on one occasion, and she said she had asked Mr. Gelman to look at the tape and let her know if he could use the materials, and that was the last time she had spoken ever to Mr. Gelman. What is missing, Your Honor, is my any promise on the part of Mr. Gelman to return the tape. You don't have to promise to return a tape. You naturally are not going to steal somebody's property. You're going to return it. Now, without testimony in plaintiff's direct case of a promise on behalf of my client, then there is no evidence of a contract, oral or otherwise, between my client and Mrs. Buell. Your Honor, DiGiulio says, I also state that even if such a promise was made, the promise here on behalf of Mr. Gelman was to view the tape. That was the consideration, to view the tape and to use the material if he could, and that the returning of the tape as alleged by Mrs. Buell was incidental uh, to that other agreement and not part of the consideration. That is absolutely wrong. Returning of the tape is not incidental. It's a must. Therefore, there would be no contract. Your Honor, setting aside liability, DiGiulio says, there are no documents, no evidence as to damages, her bills or expenses, how the claimant arrived at $120. That was my price. 
is a copy, a duplicate of a VHS when she admitted apparently that she got the original as well as other copies of the same item in VHS format. The court, I don't know the difference formats. What is uh, VHS, the judge says. Glendora, home tape, DiGiulio, VHS. You put the stuff in the VCR at home, that's the format, the cassette that was sent to my client that she has here before this court here today to allege her damages. There is no proof at all at this stage as to how she arrived at the figure. It was my price. I charge everybody 190 And if they had listened to the audio tapes, they would have seen that or heard that. She states that my figure is $120. That's what I should be paid. Having made these motions, you will either reserve a rule. Judge, I will reserve. Please do your cross-examination. Cross-examination by DiGiulio. Mrs. Buell, Glendora, do I stand for this? Judge, no. Buell, Glendora. Mrs. Buell, just so we know what we are talking about, the tape you call the Glendora, the tape that we are referring to, judge, a name, Glendora, a cheerful look at life. Is that what you call it? Yes. Glendora, uh, Mrs. Buell, when did you first make this tape? When was this? What year? What date? Oh, there were several. Let's start with cheerful look at life, Several of them. Just the one we are talking about. When did I make that tape? I think it would be 1989, on or about 1989. To Julio and Mrs. Buell, there came a time when you edited it down to ten, a 10 minute presentation, correct? Glendora, yes. To Julio, that was the copy that you sent to my client, Mr. Gelman. Glendora, edited it down to 10 minutes. Ten, uh, to Julio, 10 minutes. That is the copy you sent to my client, correct? In the 10 minutes? A copy of the master I sent to your, your client. A copy of the master, Giulio said. Mrs. Buell, where are your receipts for making that copy? The copy sent to Mr. Gelman. Do you have them in the court today? No. Glendora, you understand, I mean, Mr. Uh, DiGiulio, you understand that under the rules of this court, you would present, you would bring with you any documents or receipts pertaining to your damages. Did you understand that, Mrs. Buell? Which question do you wish me to answer? DiGiulio, did you understand it was incumbent upon you to bring with you your documentation pertaining to your damages? I ask leave of the court. I have to think about that. The judge, if you can't answer that, if you don't know the answer, if you don't understand it, please say yes or no, I don't know. Glendora, the questions doesn't apply. How do I do, th how I do things? Judge, not how you do it, were you aware of the rules? Glendora, I'm aware of the rules. I have a small claims book. DiGiulio, so that we are clear, you made all the copies that we are discussing this evening, correct? Mrs. Buell? Whereupon there was no answer by the witness but a shrug of the shoulders. Continue. DiGiulio, I will rephrase the question. Mrs. Buell, did you go to some type of outside contractor? Glendora, editing is what you call it. To Julia, I will restrate the question. The copy that you claim was sent to Mr. Gelman, that copy, you made that copy yourself, is that not correct? No, that is not necessarily correct. To Julia, then I will ask you another question. Glendora, wait just a second. You are not allowing me to answer your question. To Julia, please go ahead. Glendora. It would be one of two things. Either I made it while I was editing or I had it made at ELA Studios on 59th Street. And as to receipts of that, I would think they could be produced. DiGiulio, you don't have them in court with you today. Glendora, no, because it really... DiGiulio, yes or no, Mrs. Buell, do you have them in court today? Let's move on. Wait a second, Glendora says. Don't tell me to move on. DiGiulio, your honor, may I have a yes or a no? Glendora, restate the question. DiGiulio, Mrs. Buell, if you could, I would like you to answer this question, yes or no. As you are sitting here this evening, do you have any type of documentation, be it receipts, be it invoices, anything at all pertaining to your reproduction of that cassette with you? The answer is no, but they can be produced. DiGiulio, thank you. Mrs. Buell, you did receive a subpoena to bring to court today all your documentation pertaining to this claim. Correct, Mrs. Buell? Glendora, my answer to that is you served a subpoena on me to bring the things to the court on January 10th. My husband went to great labor and exercise to bring them, and you ignored them entirely. DiGiulio, didn't that subpoena state you were to bring the materials with you on any adjourned date? Glendora, yes, it did. DiGiulio, and, don't, and you don't have any documentation? I have much documentation concerning the pre-production of the tapes, uh, Mrs. Buell. Concerning what about the pre-production of these tapes? 
DeJulio, I will move on. Glendora, did you say that you were withdrawing your question? Glendora, I believe that I got the answer. I will move on. Do you have with you today the original of this? Pointing? Yes. Do you have copies with you today? Yes. How many copies do you have with you today? With me today, Glendora? Uh, I did Julio, yes. Glendora, I believe I have two. It's a two copies. Mrs. Buell, if I may pose my next question. Glendora, no, I am in the middle of answering your other question. I have a right to answer. I produce the master. It is a quarter of an inch. That's what they mean by format. Glendora, that goes on the air. Glendora, that's sort of a professional standard. Yes. No, it really doesn't. One inch goes on the air, Your Honor. The format drives you bananas. This is a three-quarter inch in a ten-minute format, and this is a dub, and I may have sent Mr. Gelman this little tiny half-inch VHS. That is the VHS, Your Honor, indicating. Do you have those for evidence? Glendora. No, the court. It's all right. We don't want to mark up your tape. Glendora. Okay. I'm ready for your next question. De Julio. Mrs. Buell, is it your testimony that whenever you reproduce the cassette in the VHS format that the cost to you is $120? That's my cost. That's what I charge for a tape. $120 is my charge and it is cheap. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Buell. Mrs. Buell, you know, of course, that there are many facilities within Westchester County where you live where a VHS tape can be duplicated for a tenth of that price. You are aware of that, Mrs. Buell? This is the cost of my labor, my talent, my expertise, my experience, $120. Mrs. Buell, so we understand one another. Pre-producing a VHS tape at this stage requires putting the tape into a machine, the tape with the material. No, no, you are coming at this at the wrong angle. DeGiulio, may I finish, please? Glendora, you're coming at this at the wrong angle. DeGiulio, may I continue, Your Honor? Judge, yes, you may. Uh, DeGiulio, Mrs. Buell, is it not true that to make a copy of a VHS tape, what is required is to take the original, put it in the machine, put a copy, excuse me, a blank in a similar machine, or separate? Glendora, the answer is yes to that question. DeGiulio, may I finish the question? Glendora, I know what your question is. The answer to that question is yes. Judge, for the benefit of the court reporter and the record, it is better to have a whole question asked. DeGiulio, Mrs. Buell, after the tapes are in place, all that is needed to be done is to press one or more buttons and the information on the original is transferred to the tape. Is that not correct? No, it is not correct. DeGiulio, is that not the correct process by which a VHS tape is duplicated? Yes or no, Mrs. Buell? No. DeGiulio, thank you, Mrs. Buell. Mrs. Buell, at the current time, you do your own editing at your home. Is that correct, Glendora? No. DeGiulio, you do have the ability to edit and duplicate tapes, do you not? No. DeGiulio, how about VHS tapes? Do you have the ability? No. Is he under oath? Judge, he is cross-examining you. He doesn't have to be under oath. He is a lawyer. Glendora, he doesn't have to be under oath. Judge, if he, if he was testifying, then he would be under oath. Glendora, did he declare under the penalty of perjury? Judge, he doesn't have to. As a lawyer, he is examining you. You are his witness. He is the one doing the examining. You are testifying. If he puts on a witness, that witness has to be sworn. DeGiulio, Mrs. Buell, these tapes that you sent out, am I correct in my thinking that you sent out many copies of these tapes to various TV shows, people in the television industry? Is that not correct? What do you mean by many? Well, certainly more than five. Yes, I would say maybe ten. Ten? And you sent these tapes out to encourage these television stations to retain you to send your work or to ask you to work for them. Is that not true? Try again. Glendora says to him, try again. De Julio, for what purpose did you send these tapes? Well, that's more like it. Glendora, to see if it would be a benefit for them to cheer up their audience. De Julio, did you expect to receive any sort of payment for these tapes? Glendora, yes. De Julio, there was an economical purpose for which you sent these tapes to these television stations. Glendora, yes. De Julio, Mrs. Buell, did you make it clear to each individual to whom you sent this tape that in a consideration for them receiving the tape and looking at the tape that you expected the return of the tape? 
Glendora, the answer to that, Mr. DiGiulio, is that it is implied, just the way it was implied that Mr. Gelman would return my tape. DiGiulio, so the answer to the question, Mrs. Buell, is that implied. DiGiulio, the answer to the question, Mrs. Buell, is you did not ask that the tape be returned. Is that not correct? The answer to the question is implied. And everybody else returned the tapes except unethical Michael Gelman. DiGiulio, I will restate the question. Glendora, the answer is implied. Did you state to these individuals the television stations for whom you were ex expected to receive some sort of economical gain that unless they agreed to send the tape by, you would not send the tape to them? Glendora, the answer is implied. I would never send a tape to anybody that I didn't think would return it. DiGiulio, you never asked for the return of the tape. Thank you. That's not true. On every tape that went out, it said, please return to Glendora, and it gave the address. Would I send a tape to anybody if I thought they wouldn't return it? That is the answer. I would not have sent a tape unless I trusted the person to return it. To Julio, Mrs. Buell, Glendora, and everybody else did. To Julio, Mrs. Buell, other than the $120 you already received from Michael Cass, are you listening, Mrs. Buell? Glendora, no, I want to ask my husband something. And I asked Franklin, do you feel all right? And I leaned over. And Franklin said, yes. And Glendora said, don't you think you should remove your coat? Franklin said, no. Glendora, excuse me, Mr. DiGiulio. DiGiulio, Mrs. Buell, other than the $120 you already received from Michael Katz and the monies that you are seeking herein, have you brought any other claims for the return of the tapes? I didn't have to, Mr. DiGiulio. That was the only one. DiGiulio, the answer to my question is no. The answer to your question is he was the only one who stole the tape. DiGiulio, note my objection. Court, objection is noted. DiGiulio, now Mrs. Buell, you testified on direct that you sent this tape to Mr. Gelman, correct? Glendora, are you asking me did I send the tape to Mr. Gelman? I testified that I did. Mr. DiGiulio, you know Mr. Calvin Norman, Mrs. Buell? Glendora, I have testified to that, Mr. DiGiulio. DiGiulio, you have a personal relationship with Mr. Calvin Norman? Glendora, I do not. DiGiulio, you did not state in the documents submitted to this court that you have a personal relationship with Mr. Norman? Glendora, I did not, that I know of. I do not have a personal relationship with Mr. Calvin Norman. DiGiulio, you didn't say that? Glendora, I do not have a personal relationship with Mr. Calvin Norman. DiGiulio, you have known him for a number of years? Glendora, I already testified to that, Mr. DiGiulio. DiGiulio, that it is a correct statement that you have known him a number of years? Glendora, I already testified to that. DiGiulio, you are aware of the fact that Mr. Norman stated under oath that he sent the tape in question to Mr. Gelman? You are aware of that fact, correct? I read it in his affidavit. I can't remember. I have to go back and read it. DiGiulio, are you claiming, Mrs. Buell? Yeah, uh, Glendora, yes. That you sent a second tape? Glendora, yes, of course. This was after? It's a matter of record. Yes, it was after. This was after you determined that Mr. Gelman did not return? Glendora, you should be fully aware, familiar with the facts and circumstances. DiGiulio, please, please let me finish the question. If you would answer the question, I will move on to the next question. The answer is simply, the question is simply rather, is it your testimony here today that you sent a second copy of this tape to Mr. Norman for him to give to Mr. Gelman after Mr. Gelman had received the first copy of the tape? After he had received it, yes, but not after I had heard what he said about it. DiGiulio, Mrs. Buell, you testified, we're on page 41. You testified on direct that you gave Calvin Norman the tape in 1991. That was your testimony? On or about, on or about was my testimony. DiGiulio, and you have in your notes, which you read to the court on Lincoln's birthday, February 17, 1990, you had already heard that Mr. Gelman would not use the tape on the show. So then, Mrs. Buell, I am correct in my statement that you sent or claimed you have sent a second copy of this tape after you had already heard that Mr. Gelman would not use this material. Glendora, you have to state your question. Rephrase it. You can't put five or six phrases to six things I have to answer. So take the first one first. What is your first question? If you don't understand the question, I will rephrase it. 
Glendora, and don't ask such long questions. Take it in compartments. Uh, De Julio, Mrs. Buell, you sent the tape to Calvin Norman in 1991. Yes or no? On or about? To the best of my recollection. De Julio, Mrs. Buell, you heard in February of 1990 that Mr. Gelman would not use the material on the show. Yes or no? Glendora, the court has already eliminated that as hearsay. Mr. DiGiulio, Your Honor, the witness refuses to answer these questions. Glendora, the court said that that was hearsay. You could not use that next part of your question. Mr. DiGiulio, can I get some answers to these questions? The court, Mrs. Buell, you may answer the question whether you were aware in 1990 that Mr. Gelman would not use your tape. Glendora, well, you know, up until the time he said I could not use it at all, the judge, you are not answering the question. Glendora, my answer to that question is, I don't know. You do not, uh, judge, you do not know if you were aware. Glendora, he is asking me, was I aware that Gelman already said he couldn't use the tape before I sent the other tape to him? That doesn't seem reasonable. It doesn't seem reasonable to me that I would have sent another tape to Gelman, to Calvin, if Calvin said he didn't want the tape. I don't think I would have done that. I don't know why the con what I don't know why the conflict is on that because I can't use my notes and my tapes. Judge, what I had said was if you could not testify what was in your log and you needed to refresh your recollection, you could look at it, you could look at it. Glendora, I really don't know now, but it is not reasonable to me why I would have sent Calvin the tape. To have asked Calvin to look at the tape again, that just isn't reasonable. If I had known that Gelman didn't want the tape, then I would never have sent a second one. I know I sent a second one. I will testify to that. That I know I sent a second tape because I have heard on all the audio tapes all day long how I kept saying to Calvin, I have not gotten back my tape, and I wouldn't say gotten, I would have said I have not got back my tape. The second one, how Calvin received the tape, and a woman in his office has said to, Mr. DiGiulio, your honor, is there a question here? Glendora, no, there is an answer here. I am not asking a question. DiGiulio, may I pose my next question, your honor? Court, proceed. Mrs. Buell. You have stated in several affidavits that you submitted to this court that you have recorded Michael Gelman's promise to return this tape before he viewed the tape. Glendora, repeat the question, please. Did Julio? I didn't finish the question. Mrs. Buell, you stated in several documents submitted to this court that you have recorded and saved Michael Gelman's statement that he would return this tape to you. That is not a question, it is a statement, Glendora says. To Julio, did you bring that tape to court today? No. To Julio, you did not? Glendora, no. To Julio, Mrs. Buell, isn't it true that you never recorded Michael Gelman that he would return this tape to you before he viewed the tape? Say your question again. To Julio, may I hear the question again, Miss Reporter? Whereupon the court reporter read back the last outstanding question. Answer to the last question. I still don't get it. Isn't it true that you never recorded Michael Gelman's statement that he would return this tape to you? Glendora, I will restate this question. Oh, no. To Julio says, Mrs. Buell, I will restate this question. Glendora, before he reviewed it? That doesn't make sense. To Julio, Mrs. Buell, you have stated in several documents that you have submitted to this court that Michael Gelman promised to return this tape to you. You have stated that in these statements that he made this promise before he reviewed it. Glendora, can't you put it in the form of a question? De Julio, before he viewed that tape, Mrs. Buell, is that not a lie? Glendora, did I state? No, it is not true. Would you please put that in the form of a question? Judge, it was in the form of a question. I am restating it for you, Glendora. Oh, God. The court, judge, do you have a tape of Mr. Gelman saying to you that he would return the tape to you? Glendora, 
Do I have a tape of his saying that he saying that to me that he would return the tape to me? Court, yes. Flandor, no. To Julio, did you not state in several documents that you submitted to this court that such a tape existed? Did I state before this court that such a tape existed? Judge, documents, he said. I think the question was, did you state in any documents you submitted to the court that such a tape existed? Witness, no. You, did Julio, you never made that statement, Mrs. Buell? Glendora, I don't even understand your question. To Julio, Mrs. Buell, I will need you, I will read you something. Glendora, I want the question asked, and I want to answer the question. To Julio, may I pose the next question, Your Honor? Judge, yes, you may. To Julio, Mrs. Buell, you move for summary judgment in this matter. Yes or no? Yes. So did you. To Julio, and the moving papers included an affidavit which you signed. Yes or no? Let me see it. To Julio, here's a copy, handing it over. Gondor, yes, it included an affidavit which I signed. To Julio, you want to hold that copy? Glendora, yes, thank you. To Julio, Mrs. Buell, I draw your attention to page four of that document, paragraph nine. Glendora, I have it. To Julio, do you see that the second sentence in this paragraph says this contract was made over the telephone? Glendora, I don't have it. Where is it? To Julio, page four. Glendora, I have page four, but it is not paragraph nine. To Julia, that's paragraph nine. She has found the paragraph pointing. It says, New York State adheres to the majority view that contract can be made over the telephone. Glendora, I mean to Julia, you had sworn to this document, Mrs. Buell. Did you swear to the fact that the contract was made over the telephone and is on audio? Yes. To Julia, yes or no? Glendora, yes. To Julia, where is your audio tape today, Mrs. Buell? Glendora, my husband and I have gone through six, seven, and eight audio tapes, and that's wrong. We have gone through, we went through 500 audio tapes, actually 600. An hour and a half long each, and we could not find that conversation on Christmas 1989. We could not find it. And we could not find that conversation on Christmas 1989. We could not find it. Did Julio, when you sent the tape to Mr. Gelman, did you send it with a letter? Glendora, no. Mr. DiGiulio, did you send any type of written materials? Glendora, no. To the best of my recollection, I did not send a letter. Mr. DiGiulio, did you enclose in your envelope a stamp self-address envelope to facilitate the return of the dem of the tape? Glendora, no, I did not. Glendora, Mrs. Buell, you are currently employed. I don't have to return. Uh, you know, he's all, he's trying to give an excuse for Gelman not having the ethics and not having the responsibility and not having the maturity to return a person's property. You don't have to return, uh, enclose a self-addressed stamped envelope. De Julio, Mrs. Buell, do you currently create television shows which are aired on public uh, access television? Glendora, you better try again, OK? You have fallen into a very common pit. De Julio, did you not prepare materials which are broadcast over public access television? Glendora, all right. No, I do not. To Julio, do you not have shows which you air on which you have aired on public access TV stations in Westchester, Nassau, Suffolk, Rockland, and New Jersey? Glendora, no. I do not air public access. I cable cast them. To Julio, I apologize. Apparently you know the vernacular. Glendora, I certainly do, and you should because you are representing a broadcast client. And you should know the difference between the broadcast and ca between broadcast and cable cast. De Julio, may I pose my next question? Glendora, restate your question now. I would like to answer it because the answer to that stated correctly. Do I cable cast programs? Do you cable cast programs? I don't cable cast, but I do have them cable cast. De Julio, and litigation 
that you were involved in? Glendora, I testified to that already. To Julio, is it not true, Mrs. Buell, that the litigation that you are involved in is discussed on these programs which find their way onto public access TV? Glendora, I object to that. Okay, we're up to page 51. And next week, I'll read you more. This is Glendora versus Michael Gelman on the matter that Michael Gelman did not have the ethics, the honesty, or the responsibility to return my property. I sent him two VHS videotapes, and he never returned them. He kept them, or he lost them. But he was never man enough to face what he did, say he was wrong, and atone for it. So I sued him for $380. These minutes cost me $400. And the matter is in the appellate term of uh, down in Manhattan. So she has plenty of men at her feet, and her mother-in-law says, yes, they're all podiatrists. And uh, the grandmother asked the little girl if she wanted to see the cuckoo come out of the cuckoo clock. And the little girl said, yes, please. And I would like to see grandfather come out of the grandfather clock. And Billy said to his mother, am I made of sage and parsley? and uh, breadcrumbs, and his mother says, no, why? And Billy says, well, Bobby said he was going to beat the stuffing out of me. Here, the CBS, uh, Columbia Broadcasting System, the first uh, quarter report, and now I see why <laughs> Lawrence Tisch was not the Lawrence Tisch I told you he was, the ebullient Lawrence Tisch that he was, uh, because, uh, well, let me just read his statement here. The company's net sales and net income declined in the first quarter of 1995 to $897.1 million and $21.8 million. Let's take it in its parts. The net sales uh, declined to $897 million and the uh, net income declined to 21.8 million. And uh, last year in the first quarter, the net sales were uh, 1.2 billion. And uh, the uh, net income was 69 million. So this is why Mr. Tish was not the happy Mr. Tish that I've seen in the past. What is their uh, cash and uh, marketable securities? Uh, 280 million. Two hundred and eighty million. Uh, what else is in here? So it's a very fast, quick uh, annual report. Their total assets, though, are 2.2. Let's see, total assets in millions. That's got to be 2.2 billion. I guess so. Well, seems like they would be more than Cablevision, though. It's t it says that it's in millions, dollars in millions, and it's 2, comma 244.5. Yeah, it's 2 billion. Cash and cash equivalents at the end of the period was 3.3 .3 million. Now we know why he was so down at the annual meeting, but he did laugh at my joke anyhow. And at the annual meeting were Peter Keegan, finance, and Ellen Caden, uh, counsel, and uh, Peter Lund took the place of Howard Stringer. He says here that CBS did brilliantly with the David Letterman show. It's been number one in late night, and that's a first for CBS. They've never done anything in late night. It's always been David Letterman over on NBC and Johnny Carson. So, at last, they got the late night. The morning news is a dismal failure, of course, it always will be because at the time the Today Show started on NBC 20, 30, 25, 30 years ago, uh, NBC dominated that whole morning period with the Today Show. That was the Pat Weaver concept. And then uh, ABC picked up and decided to, uh, and they had uh, David Hartman with Good Morning America. And uh, so ABC is giving them composition, but competition, but CBS never will make it because they had Captain Kangaroo on so long, a kid's show, and that, uh, so they never could get into the morning news market. 
What's to say here about QBC? Uh, since last summer when our proposed acquisition of QBC did not go through, there have been a lot of rumors and speculation about the possible sale of CBS. Our policy has been and continues to be that we do not comment on market rumors. It doesn't say that he's not going to sell CBS, though. In daytime, CBS is number one with all of their dirty soap operas, The Young and the Restless. And uh, the sports division is way down because they lost the NFL. Uh, 60 Minutes is the top 10 f is in the top 10 for an unmatched 18th consecutive year. And the new shows they mention, the only one I watch is uh, Nanny. Eighty-one percent of the corporation's voting stock was represented in person by our proxy, or by the proxy, at the annual meeting. And that's that's it. They're on internet, internet worldwide web users can access information on CBS and his programming through CBS Eye on the Net. There was a clipping in the Wall Street Journal that they had a meeting of the CBS affiliates and of course they're angry because you know how that works? You see if CBS doesn't get the ratings then the affiliates all across the country, 200 of them or so, can't go out and sell at a big price because they don't have the ratings. You, you pay for airtime by the number of people who are watching. So if CBS doesn't give them the ratings on the network, then they don't have a whole lot of people watching and they can't go out and get the big prices. So it says here that one of the affiliates, the president of the affiliates, made Lawrence Tisch say that he would step down as far as running the CBS broadcast group and let Peter Lund uh, give him full autonomy. But at the annual meeting, Peter Lund didn't say anything. He didn't say boo. Tisch ran the show. Another announcement is this nice card. It came from my... Uh, alumni friends at American International College, the uh, reunion that I couldn't go to because of number one, we have the, all these lawbreakers, two, we have all these lying lawyers, crooked lawyers, and number three, we have no courts, we just have corrupt judges. So because of fighting all this, uh, I didn't have time to go to my uh, college alumni meeting. Anyway, uh, John Nash says, I remember you from classical high school and from AIC. That's American International College. I especially remember the time you entertain everybody in my home room, <laughs> except the teacher. Uh, Glendora, something you, I saw you on TV. That would be on the network, the NBC television network or on the CBS television network because it wouldn't be on cable. It doesn't go that far. I saw you on TV. You were great and looked wonderful. And that would be Mark Diefendorf. Uh, Zayden. Best of luck from Stan Abramson, Greenfield, Massachusetts. Keep up the good TV work. Joe O'Claire. Hi, Glendora. Hope you and Frank, my former associate at Springfield Union, are well. Uh, miss seeing you both. Jerry Ratting, he's a sports reporter on the Springfield Union. Glendora, hmm. have seen more of you on TV than you have of me. However, I'm still something. Uh, anyways, Rod Henry. Rod Henry is an interesting person. He was in the war and both of his hands were blown off. And I used to sit, be, sit near him in, uh, in uh, college classes, and he had these, uh, these things that were very good, and he would pick up his books with those, and he would do his writing with those. And he persisted with no hands, and he ended up uh, being a director of an art museum in Springfield. A very, very brave man. Hi, Glendora. We did miss you. I hope you really plan to be at the 50th anniversary of the classical high school reunion and that's in November. That's my Springfield, uh, Massachusetts high school. Love, Andy. That's Eleanor Anderson. Space to read you the Colabella excoriation of 40 pages so that will have to wait in next week and there isn't any space to uh, read you uh, uh, my uh, affidavit that Judge and Grassier, no judge, signed that uh, judgment 
uh, for COSA to collect $400 from me or $450 from me. It's bad enough that they didn't give me justice. They certainly shouldn't charge me for not giving me justice. It's a chat with Glendora from what happened on uh, the week from June the 8th to June the 15th, today, 1995. We'll close with some jokes, and we wish you the very best. Stay still. Is this your brother? And the little boy said, yes, Pastor. Pastor, well, he's kind of small, isn't he? Little boy, yeah, but he's only my half-brother. And, Harold, you said you were going to see your dentist this afternoon. Yes, I did. Well, on the bus, I looked out the window, and I saw you going into the, ball point, uh, into the ballpark with a short, fat man. Harold, yeah, that was my dentist. My baby brother is only a year old, and he's been walking for nine months. Really, said Henry? He must be awful tired. God bless you. This is flag day yesterday. My flags are flying. That's why you don't see them up here in the wall. I've got two flags flying, one to the east and one to the west, because yesterday was June 14th, flag day. Uh, fight against evil. Keep the courage flaming. God bless you. Hi. Uh, this went out uh, yesterday to uh, a great long list of people. And I'll read that to you in just a second. And this is the Supreme Court of the state of New York County of Westchester, Glendora Plaintiff against Daniel Walsh, Roberta Walsh, James Walsh, Nella Alpucci, Theo Alpucci, Andrew Larkin, and Kevin Larkin, defendants. It's index number 20482-93, index number which cost $275. Is that right? $170 for the index number, and the RJI is... Uh, $75, $245. Affidavit by Glendora to Judge Ingracia that Coza has the wrong judge, an affidavit by Glendora in opposition to her paying any costs. Glendora being duly sworn to poses and says her reasons follow for opposing the Wilson Babe Coza mailing of June the 8th, 1995, on the grounds they have the wrong judge and they have the wrong costs. Judge Wood dismissed Glendora's complaint against the Larkins, for whom Wilson, Babe, Coza were the lawyers. Judge Wood never declared the Larkin branch of Glendora's case ready for trial. Therefore, the Larkin branch of the lawsuit never went to Judge Ingracia. Therefore, Judge Ingracia is not the judge for this proposed Wilson, Babe, Coza judgment settlement, mailed June the 8th, 1995, and a juror's doctor should know that, the juror's doctor being Michael Coza. After Judge Wood dismissed Glendora's complaint against Larkin, Glendora asked Judge Wood to declare her case ready for trial. Judge Wood did immediately. Then Bendish moved Judge Wood to dismiss the Glendora complaint against Walsh and Apulci. He had the wrong judge. A juror's doctor should know better, the juror's doctor being Michael Koza. On May 31st, Judge Ingracia did unjustly uh, dismiss Glendora's complaint against Walsh and Apulci. But the Larkin branch never got to Judge Ingracia. So the Wilson Babe Coza paper should never have said, Judge Ingracia is their judge. They didn't get that far, so the judgment cannot be signed by Judge Ingracia. The blue back says Judge Ingracia, and the insides uh, say the county clerk. Glendora wants to stop this before anybody signs it. Coza owes Glendora $30 witness fee for August the 22nd and August the 25th, 1994. She has made 23 demands for payment. He is a deadbeat. The bill for the minutes is illegible. The $200 cost is wrong. There are seven defendants, Wilson, Babe, Coza, representing just two of them. So it is seven into $200 equals $28.57 times two is equal to $57.14. A Juris Doctor should know that. And the Juris Doctor is Michael Coza. Glendora opposes any cost. The court already has taken away our right to peaceably dwell and enjoy our home. You let these seven defendants break four laws 2,500 times and injure us 2,500 times. That is enough. You do not have to abuse us further with cost. You did this because you wanted to stay on the good side of Wilson, Babe, Coza at all so you could get a political appointment as a JHO. This is addressed, of course, to Judge Wood. It is atrocious he's the one who awarded costs. It is atrocious that you sold justice and our courts for your own selfishness. We have been stripped of our courts. All we have left is a pile of rubble. We don't have any courts left, folks. We just have a pile of rubble. 
Look down at it. It's a pile of rubble. You want us to pay fee-bulging Wilson Babe all this money when we are senior citizens squeaking by on two Social Security checks and Franklin's pension. Is this any way to treat people 67 and 76 years old? We need a recall referendum to get you judges out of here when you do these fiendish things. Diabolical Judge Colabella manipulated judgment against Glendora without even a hearing. His record has to be the crookedest on record. He should be removed instantly. You people are not doing your job. Gerald Stern is afraid of you. He's afraid he will lose his political appointment if he does, if he goes after you Westchester County Supreme Court judges. Gerald Stern is the supposed head of the Commission on Judicial Conduct. Sing the 9X song. We're all connected. The Commission on Judicial Conduct is a farce, just as the Fund for Modern Courts is a sham. Glendora is legally due her cost from her victory over Cablevision, but Judge Silverman has signed two orders in joining her from collecting them. This is demented. On June the 19th, 1995, Monday, 9 a.m. to 11 a.m., we rally against your self-serving antics and you're robbing us of your cost. You have demolished our faith. Where do you go when judges break the laws? That is why we need a recall referendum. That we should have to put up with you for 14 years is bizarre. You did nothing about cheap Coza not paying Glendora's witness fees, $30. You are afraid of him. Judge Bryant, United States District Court, Southern District of New York, stood up to Cablevision and said, no costs. You could have done that. Get lawyers out of the legislature. Get real people in there. In sum, it would be foolhardy to say nothing of unjust, and your job is justice, not injustice, to sign this order for costs. Dated White Plains, New York, June 14, 1995, Flag Day. Yours in truth, Glendora, Box 416, White Plains, New York, 10602-914-949-9495. Subscribed and sworn to before me this 15th day of June, and it's notarized. And down here it tells them there will be a citizens rally against the bad judges in Westchester Supreme Court, June the 19th, 1995, 9 to 11 a.m at Westchester County Courthouse. This goes to Wilson Babe Coza, Bruce Bendish, Judges K, Trafficante, uh, Glendora's TV audience, that's you, and Judge Wood, and to the county clerk. And it was served by Franklin, there's his affidavit of service. And what do we get in the mail from Juris Doctor, so-called Coza? Something I suspect is a lie. Westchester County Clerk, Glendora versus Walsh, etc. To the clerk, dear sir, madam, on June 8, 1995, we sent the original and copy of Defendant Larkin's judgment and bill of costs with notice of settlement. However, due to a typographical error, Judge Ingracia was named as the assigned judge, both on our letter and also on the upper right hand first page of our judgment. We are therefore submitting herewith an amended judgment correctly for reflecting Judge Wood as the assigned judge in this matter. You know, a pro se can beat one of these juris doctors almost any day. A pro se can beat a juris doctor almost any day. After the bill of costs has been taxed, please file the original papers and return a conformed copy so we may serve same with notice of entry. We are enclosing a stamp self-address envelope for your convenience in returning the same. Thank you. Very truly yours, Wilson, babe, Comboy, Coza, and Cousins, Michael J. Coza. And he doesn't even sign it, you know. He doesn't even sign it. He didn't even sign the first one. Poor excuse for a jurist doctor. And here it is on the back, Harold Wood instead of judging grass, you know, on the blue back. Now, uh, this is on appeal. These this very bad decision of Judge Wood. And also, uh, Judge Ingracia will, uh, his very bad decision will be appealed. And there is a law that when it's on appeal, uh, a judgment can't be enforced. You, you, all you have to do is even notify him that you are going on appeal. So one, the Larkin thing is on appeal, and the Ingracia thing is going on appeal uh, around about June 30th. January 1994. This is the slobbiest law firm that you could imagine. Wilson, Babe, Comboy, Coza, and Cousins. 
Unbelievable. What did the liar say? The liar said, it gives me a grand and a glorious feeling to be a liar. And his client says, that's right, you give him a grand and he feels glorious. Tipped him off that Glendora caught his error. Who tipped him off? Somebody had to tip him off. I was all over the county courthouse Tuesday telling people that Screwball Coza had the wrong judge. So before uh, everybody over the courthouse got the thing that I just read you saying that Coza had the wrong judge, somebody tipped him off and he got out a letter and says, oh, it's a typo. Don't believe that one. Noon when Franklin delivered uh, this to Judge Wood personally, or at least by hand, uh, he went to the 18th floor and Judge Wood has been stripped of his courtroom and uh, which was a very large courtroom, one of the large ones. And uh, it's all taken over by Judge Donovan. And then Franklin had to find out where they put Judge Wood. They put him on the eighth floor. The eighth floor? There's only one courtroom on the eighth floor. Or is there another one? Yeah, I guess another one, but that's where the calendar clerks are. And nobody could find it. Nobody knew where it was. They knew it was somewhere on the eighth floor. And then finally, a woman showed Franklin where it was. And the, the room is half as big as our kitchen. It's like a dungeon. And I, it's, it must be, it must make him feel awful. I feel awful for him. Even though I hate what he did to us. And even though he deserves it, I still feel sorry for him. 75 years old through December the 31st this year and to end up like that. Dean Ottinger, down with Dean Ottinger, the dean of the Pace University School of Law and down with Professor Triffin, the head of the Pace Law Library. There's no need of their selfishness. There's no need of having all those books there and not letting people read them. There's just no need of that at all. They've closed the library to the public. And how can you do that after the public has been there for years? When the public has used it, the public has a certain right to it, just the way you do uh, Rockefeller Plaza. Rockefeller Plaza is a private street and the public has a right to it after all these years. And being lawyers, they ought to know that. Ottinger and down with Professor Triffin, Pace Law Library, Pace University School of Law. Uh, folks, I wanted to show you our preparations for Law Day. This is a great button, V-O-C-C, -C, Victims of Corruption in the Courts. And Our rally is going to be Monday, June the 19th, 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. at 111 Grove Street, White Plains, which is the location of the county courthouse tower, 19 floors of injustice. Uh, and we have a permit from the city of White Plains to rally on the sidewalk, because that's what the city of White Plains owns. And I know that we're going to be asked to display these because a certain judges are going to send out their flunkies, New York State court officers, and they're going to ask them to us to show our permits. So there's our permit from the city of White Plain, signed by uh, Hickey, Mr. Hickey. And that gives us permission to rally on the sidewalk in front of the county courthouse tower. And over here is our permit from the County of Westchester that gives us permission to rally on the courthouse plaza in front of the courthouse. And then yesterday, Franklin got the permit for the bullhorn. And that cost $5. 
and the sidewalk permit rally is good for two weeks, every day for two weeks, and the uh, bullhorn permit is five dollars for every day. Now I want to tell you something about that. Mr. Hickey called Franklin over before he gave him this permit and he reminded him that even though we have a permit for a bullhorn there is the White Plains noise ordinance. Two things about that. What judge called Mr. Hickey and tried to stop Mr. Hickey from giving us this bullhorn permit, which of course you can't do because we're entitled to it. But who tried to, and how did Mr. Hickey try to get out of it by mentioning the White Plains noise ordinance? That's one thing. Who's trying to stop it? Two is, you remember how many complaints, you are my witnesses, you remember how many complaints I brought to the White Plains Police Department about maybe 100 or 150 violations of the White Plains Noise Ordinance by Daniel, James, and Roberta Walsh, Nella and Theo Alpucci, and Kevin and Andrew Larkin. Andrew Larkin is a Harrison police officer. You know the number of complaints. And I have it on videotape, I have it on audio tape, and the White Plains Police Department entirely ignored this for a matter of a year and a half. So that's two things about the White Plains Noise Ordinance. And now, here are, here's the flyers that we're going to hand out. Politically connected, down with Colavita, down with Balletta, down with Sullivan, down with Mangano, down with Ritter, down with Miller, down with the Commission on Judicial Conduct, down with Gerald Stern. One, two, three, four, we won't take it anymore. Down with Gerald Stern, we want justice. Greedy, grubby judges who always rule for what is best for judges. Crooked lawyers, corrupt courts. Seven, eight, uh, five, six, seven, eight, whom do we investigate? The judges, the judges, the bad, bad judges. Reinstate Doris Sassauer, down with Herman Kahn, down with Ostrow, down with Traficanti, down with Malonis, enemies of justice. Judges are liars, judges are cheats, judges are thieves. Victims in corruption in the courts, victims of corruption in the courts. More rallies coming. We want justice, honesty, and honor. The Commission for Judicial Account, the uh, the Committee for no, the Center for uh, Judicial Accountability, Box 69, Gedney Station, White Plains, New York, 10605. For the latest in court corruption, watch Glendora every Tuesday at 9 p.m. on TCI Channel 8. Uh, this is our uh, press release that went to everybody, WCBS TV, WABC TV, WNBC TV, uh, Channel One, uh, WFAS, uh, Yorktown News, Yonkers News. A rally protesting the actions and decisions of some New York Supreme Court judges is scheduled Monday, June 19th from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. in front of the Westchester County Courthouse Tower, 111 Grove Street, White Plains. The demonstration is a citizen's response to widespread concern about lapses by some judges in meeting the standards of the Judicial Code of Conduct. Politically motivated decisions are a major breach of the code, which calls for impartiality and justice. Rallies to call attention to what is seen as a growing laxity by the judiciary in administering the law evenly and honestly have been held recently at the Rockland County Courthouse, Carmel, the Appellate Division, Second Department of the State Supreme Court, Brooklyn, and the Suffolk County Courthouse, Islip. Members of the Center for Judicial Accountability will be participating. And these are our little stickers, Citizens Rally Against Bad Judges, Westchester Supreme Court, June 19, 1995, 9 to 11 a.m. at Westchester County Courthouse. 
Yeah, I went to Gannett Newspapers, Women's News, Citizens Rally, Against Bad Judges, uh, WNBC TV, WCBS TV, WABC TV, Channel 11 News, uh, Yonkers Cablevision News, Channel 5 News, Channel 9 News. Okay, now I'll show you our posters. Put these permits right on top. There's the permit, and there's the receipt for it. So I imagine the judges are going to pull every stop that they can to stop this. But it's the First Amendment in action. It'll be very, very interesting. I got my magic marker to uh, write on the posters. Now, you can't carry sticks. You can't carry any sticks. Uh, you have to carry the posters like this. Down with Thomas Mallon, down with Stephen Kellner, down with Raymond Powell, down with Paul Carlucci, down with Elizabeth Hubbard, Alan Beck, Michelle Mayapath, the Fund for Modern Courts. Now, while I'm getting these things in here, I ought to tell you a joke about the nursery school teacher. She had the children out for a walk, and she said, at least we can all be thankful for one thing. We are all free. And a little boy says, I am not free. I am four. OK. This is the literature that we'll be handing out for the Center for Judicial Accountability, our future, who we are, uh, what do you do when judges break the law. And there's a third piece. Just a second, folks. There's one piece I read to told you about. Yes, count me in as a member of the Center for Judicial Accountability. Let's put their uh, name and number up on the screen. So we will hand those out. Now we also have a petition. And this petition says, we, the people, hereby petition of Governor George Pataki to appoint a state commission to investigate and hold public hearings on judicial corruption and the political manipulation of judgeships in the state of New York. Because the Commission on Judicial Conduct never gets anything done. OK, do something about judicial corruption. Join the Center for Judicial Accountability, Incorporated, 914 421-1200, P.O. Box 69, Gedney Station, White Plains, New York, 10605. And strings are attached. And these are my blank posters that I'm going to uh, fill up with protests. And you know what these posters are? See this? Glendora Health Nook. That was when, uh, way back in 1976, uh, that uh, was an account of mine. At that time, Vegilinks was a, a vegetarian hot dog, and it's still available. And it was owned by Miles Laboratories. And they mishandled the marketing of it. And uh, so Worthington Foods bought it back. And I got this product into the AMPs and the uh, First National stores in uh, the New York uh, metropolitan market. It was an interesting problem, and I did their commercials on TV, and then I had these health nooks in the stores. And uh, I would go and show the people about the product, because, you know, I'm a vegetarian. I don't believe in murdering, torturing, agonizing, terrorizing animals. And uh, so I don't eat meat. And so they have all these meat analogs. They have hot dogs. They have uh, fish analogs. They have... Uh, uh, hamburgers, they have roasts, uh, 
They're delicious too. Uh, and they have uh, uh, scallops and uh, uh, chickats, which are just just like the others, and turkats and things like that. And so they all taste the same. And certainly they have no animal products in them. They're all made from textured soy protein. So we eat those. We don't eat meat. So that's the rally, and that's going to be on June 19th, Monday, this coming Monday, between 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. at 111 Grove Street, White Plains, New York, the Westchester County Courthouse Tower, against crooked lawyers and against corrupt judges. And I know of no other in the Westchester County Courthouse. Okay, this was served on uh, Flag Day, uh, the 14th of June. Supreme Court of the State of New York, County of Westchester, Glendora Plaintiff against Elizabeth Hubbard, Alan Beck, Michelle Mayapath, and the Fund for Modern Courts defendants. Uh, it's in the appellate division, number 94090045, but this one comes from the Westchester County Supreme. What's supreme about it? Court. Index number 20867 of 93. This is an affidavit by plaintiff in opposition to Judge Colabella's so-called hearing, quote, unquote, of March the 6th, 1995, and to his ex-party statement that he will sign a judgment against her for $4,500 and six demands by plaintiff on this court. Glendora being duly sworn to poses and says her reasons follow for protesting the pervious deceit and Judge Colabella ineptitude of March 6, 1995 with no notice to Glendora until June the 10th, 1995. From March the 6th, I didn't even know what was going on March the 6th and I'm not even notified about it until June the 10th. That's three months. A. Judge Colabella overlooked, mistook, and misapprehended controlling law. 1. No judge has the right to call a litigant to a hearing with three hours' notice. And when that litigant is unable to appear on such stupidly short notice, hold a hearing without her there. 2. When Glendora said no at 11.10 a.m. to a hearing to be held at 2 p.m. that day, a good judge would have said, call Purvis and tell him no hearing today, and then directed that a letter be sent to both sides that a hearing is scheduled on such and such a date and time with six or seven weeks notice. This is how honest, honorable, qualified judges and court clerks and law clerks do things. Here is what Judge Colabella did wrong, March the 6th, 1995. He denied Glendora a chance to be heard. He was guilty of ex parte hearing only one side. He showed he didn't know the first thing about being a judge. He violated Glendora's First Amendment rights. He violated Glendora's 14th Amendment rights. Under color of state, Judge Colabella violated Title 42 of the United States Code, Section 1983, Civil Rights. Glendora is protected under the Constitution of the United States. He violated those rights. He is liable to Glendora. He overlooked the law. He is under oath to uphold. He overlooked controlling legal principles. He misapprehended the facts. He mistakenly arrived at decisions. He was totally deficient. All of Supra, paragraphs A through K, further apply to everything Judge Colabella has done on Glendora versus Hubbard, Beck, Mayapath, Fund for Modern Courts, and the friend lawyer, Mr. Purvis. Glendora has not been heard. Glendora demands to be heard justly, fairly, and intelligently. Glendora demands that the court give her a date to be heard, providing two weeks to prepare. It is outrageous to think Glendora could prepare for a hearing in three hours. This case is nearly 2,000 pages. This is a 2,000 pages of bad record by Harvard Beck Mayapath, the Fund for Modern Courts, Purvis, Judge Colabella, Court Clerks Thomas Mallon, Stephen Kellner, and Law Clerk Raymond Powers. No, it's Powell. It is unbelievable that Judge Colabella told Purvis March the 6th, 1995, that he would sign the order. The judge had not even heard Glendora. One has to be a special type of crooked to do that. It is Judge Colabella's fault that Glendora could not come to the hearing on March the 16th, 1995, on three hours' notice. And at that hearing, ex parte, behind my back, 
Judge Colabella told Purvis that he would sign an order making Glendora pay Purvis $4,500 attorney's fees. This is a matter of $4,500. In contrast to this, look at pages 2 and 3 of the minutes of the March 6 hearing to read how Judge Colabella treats Purvis. Judge Colabella says, now this is on the record, these are the minutes. However, on one prior occasion, I attempted to schedule on short notice a hearing, and Mr. Purvis was unable to make it at that time, which I think was maybe two or three weeks ago, and that was at the request by me through my court clerk, Mr. Mallon, who called Mr. Purvis, and we couldn't do it on that day because he wasn't prepared. It was not his fault because it was very short notice. See, he says that for Purvis. But does he give me the same leniency? Does he say it isn't my fault? No. And what does that show you? Outrageous prejudice. Outrageous bias. Outrageous inability to sit on a bench. How is super for objectivity, impartiality, due process? This is the same ex parte way Judge Colabella powers Kellner and Mallon double-crossed Glendora in June, July, 1994. It's really, his name is Raymond Powell. And these are uh, mistakes to say him, call him Powers. His name is Raymond Powell, he's a law clerk, which Glendora, or the lawless clerk, uh, which Glendora complained about to Judges K, Trafficante, Menelonis, and Ingracia, Do Nothing, Gerald Stern, Gary Casella, et al., all over New York, Courtland. Now the Colabella gang does it again, underhanded, illegal, behind Glendora's back, shoddy, crooked, corrupt, diabolical. Judge Colabella's evil will fall on his progeny. How can you call it a hearing when the plaintiff was not there, and it was the judge's fault that the plaintiff was not there? Purvis letter of June the 9th, 1995 to Judge Colabella says, as you requested, I obtained a transcript of the hearing before you on March the 6th, 1995. I'll show you this letter. This is also ex parte. Where is said request a matter of record? Colabella requests Purvis to make, get, get a copy of the minutes. I don't see that anywhere in writing. That's also ex parte. Where is said request in the minutes? Purvis does not sign his letter, just as he never declared under penalty of perjury. And look whom Purvis is trying to make pay for the minutes. He's trying to make me pay for the minutes. I didn't order the minutes. I didn't ask for the minutes. See that $65 down there? I have to pay for these minutes? It wasn't my idea. It was Judge Colabella's idea. Let him pay for it. Or let, Col uh, let Purvis pay for it. This is a ripoff on top of a ripoff. Court stenographers are a ripoff anyway at $5 for a page, a page they don't even fill, double spacing, wide margins, left and right, top and bottom. They get about one third of what you could get on a page. Also, no competitive bidding. On top of this ripoff, Purvis tries to rip off Glendora to pay the original ripoff. Glendora did not order the minutes. She was not consulted. How crooked can a court get? And these law-breaking defendants lawyer get. Right here, let Glendora remind us all that Harvard Beck, Mayor Path, and the Fund for Modern Courts masquerade as a court reform association. That's their business, to reform the courts. Signs of the masquerade are, A, they break the law left and right, B, they defy court procedures, C, they are fugitives from service, D, they are fugitives from discovery, E, they are violators of ex parte, F, what court reforms have they ever implemented? G, they get paid and they abuse volunteers. H, they lie and go back on their word. I, they fall, they fail to keep contracts. 15, this is blatant. There is blatant collusion between judge and defendants. It is like, you write nice things about me, modern courts, says Colabella, and I'll write in your favor every time. And I'll rule in your favor every time. That's what it's like. C, more shady misapplication by judge, clerks, defendants, lawyer. CPLR 2219 states that a judge has 60 days to rule. Judge Colabella has wildly broken this law. Why did it take Hubbard Purvis from March the 6th, 1995 to June the 10th, 1995 to inform Glendora there was a so-called hearing? 
on March the 6th, 1995. And what Judge Coppola did, I mean, excuse me, yeah, there's another one. And what Judge Colabella so foolishly did at that hearing. Glendora could not go to TAP November the 30th, 1994, because she had an oral argument before three judges at the United States Court of Appeals, Second Circuit, Foley Square, the big time. Here is Judge Colabella's letter, order, saying that there will be a hearing on November the 30th, 1994. But on November the 30th, 1994, Glendora had to appear before three judges at the United States Court of Appeals, Second Circuit, Foley Square. We are, to, we are up to page 10. In this order, Judge Colabella says it can be resolved only by a hearing. Glendora has not had a hearing. He contradicts himself. This is just the way Judge Colabella went back on his word regarding A, he said no motions, yet let's Purvis make a motion. B, I will personally see to it that the defendants will be here, he said, and he went back on his word. C, conference June so-and-so, no conference. D, conference June so-and-so too, no conference, a second date, and no conference. Judge Colabella never keeps his word on anything except ex parte behind the back crooked abuses of court procedure by defendants and lawyer. Glendora would like to put Judge Colabella under discovery and get a few answers to what he did wrong in court. After that, Mr. Purvis called and tried to wrangle a hearing date on his own over the telephone. Glendora would have nothing to do with his crooked scheme. Glendora reminds us all that the Fund for Modern Courts masquerades as a court reform association. How much more false can you get than that? D, Judge Colabella does ex parte once with Glendora, 23. January the 18th, 1995, Wednesday, 8.30 a.m., dress up for the conference with Judge Wood. 9 a.m., got to the courthouse, 400 people in the lobby, naturalization day. Franklin took up one box, Glendora went and got another. A nice man carried Glendora's box in the elevator to the eighth floor. And then Franklin had to take the two up to the 18th floor. Each box was 20 pounds. Glendora went back to get a third one as she stood in line Insecurity, which is a pain in the neck. On the way back, a tall, slim, good-looking man was exiting. He looked at Glendora, expecting good humor and a joke, but Glendora did not come forth with any because he was Judge Colabella, who injured Glendora unjustly and spitefully and maliciously. He said, hello, Glendora. Glendora nodded. He went by. Glendora turned to see where he went. Then he came back. When do you want that hearing scheduled? Glendora hesitated and said nothing. He volunteered, I'm doing it, as if he were to take care of things right. Glendora did not say anything. He said again, when do you want me to schedule it? Glendora remained stone-faced and said, any time. Judge Colabella is a man who cannot be trusted and who cannot trust himself. E. Defendant's lawyer's respondent's brief was due in the appellate division May the 1st, 1995. This is June the 14th, and they have not done the job yet. Glendora reminds us all that the Fund for Modern Courts masquerades as a court reform association, and they repeatedly break court rules. The record on appeal on these people is atrocious. Judge Colabella, lack of qualifications. F. Glendora has complained to Gerald Stern of the Commission on Judicial Conduct several times about Nicholas Colabella. Nothing that she knows of has been done. They are as much of a masquerade as the so-called Fund for Modern Courts. They censure and remove judges in small towns, non-lawyers, females in upstate New York, but they are afraid to touch the big guys in Westchester Supreme Court. This is just the way modern courts so-called is. They all sing the Nine Acts theme song. We're all connected. Did the Fund for Modern Courts write a report in 1993-94 on Nicholas Colabella? Glendora is investigating. The whole thing of Judge Colabella ruling on Fund for Modern Courts is a conflict of interest. Anyway, long before his March 6, 1995 hearing, quote unquote, so-called Judge Colabella should have removed himself.
Glendora has reported on TV a dozen or more chapters of the corruption of the Colabella Court, with graphics on the screen, spite and malice in the Judge Colabella Court, alternating with crooked lawyers, corrupt courts. An honest judge would have recused himself months ago. The case was dormant so long, several of us thought Judge Colabella was just letting it go, and he should have. It was a mean shock to us all that he did not. Three months later, Glendora gets his package from Purvis, June the 10th, 1995. Now we agitate for recusal. The Commission on Judicial Conduct should agitate for removal from the bench. Judge Colabella knows nothing about being a judge. Franklin and Glendora used to admire him. Now we have nothing but contempt for him. What he has done is hack unreasonable and infantile. The evil tells on Colabella's countenance day to day, like Dorian Gray. The black robe is a symbol of the black existence. Glendora would like to see a holy grail judge in a white robe, symbolizing purity. Now Judge Colabella will never receive this document Glendora is writing. Kellner, Mallon, and Powell will keep it from him the way they have all papers in the past. Maybe Judge Colabella will see it on TV, but he hides from us all. He does not do his homework. He does not read Glendora's papers. What Judge Colabella pulled off March the 6th, 1995, in addition to all the other things listed here, was incredibly arrogant. Who does he think he is? He had no right to do what he did that day, nor from the start. Glendora heard an acerbated clerk on Judge Colabella's floor complain about his me-first character. Glendora seen him four times put his left foot on the bench, lean his right elbow on his left knee, and his chin on his right hand. No wonder our video cameras are seized at the entrance to the public's courthouse. Nobody wants a record of what we see in here. This is a poor excuse for a judge. Such judges should not be there for 14 years. What we need is recall, referendum. What chance does an injured, innocent person, Glendora, have with rotten, depraved defendants, Hubbard, Beck, Mayapath, modern courts, lawyer Purvis, and Judge Colabella, Mallon, Kelma, and Powell? Take a look at Judge Paul Bella's signature. Katie, I'm going to get up. There it is, right there. That's his signature. It is as meaningless as the judge's paycheck. I will sign it, quote unquote, Judge Paul Bella said, without ever having heard the plan. He has lost all sense of propriety. Judge Colabella and Glendora's experience never has been on the bench at 9.30 a.m. Glendora asked Mallon, what time will he be in the bench? Mallon, nobody knows. It's up to him. Each time Glendora went to his courtroom, he never made it until around 10.30 a.m. Then he gets up and leaves the bench without any explanation. People wait and wait. Then he comes back when he feels like it. G. Glendora still wants discovery. Judge Colabella let these people lie and cover up and get away with it. For instance, is Purvis a relative of the defendants? H. Citizens rally against bad judges on June the 19th, 1995, Monday. From 9 a.m. to 11 a.m., we are rallying outside the Westchester County Courthouse Tower. We have a White Plains police permit and our Westchester County permit. We are going to get a bullhorn permit. Down with Judge Colabella. One, two, three, four, we can't take it anymore. Five, six, seven, eight, whom do we investigate? The judges, the judges, the bad, bad judges. Citizens rally against bad judges. Westchester Supreme Court, June 19, 1995, 9 to 11 a.m. at Westchester County Courthouse. Glendora slept just one hour Sunday night after receiving the shameful June the 8th, 1995 packet from Purvis, we are stripped of our courts. All there is left, folks, is rubble. 
Glendora will motion the appellate division to vacate the order, which Judge Colabella said, I will sign it, all the time exposing the crookedness of defendant's lawyer in court. And the second dep department, the appellate division, is just as crooked as the Westchester Supreme Court. We're all connected. Glendora and Franklin gave more than 100 hours and their money to volunteer for the Fund for Modern Courts, Hubbard Beck Mayor Path, and look at the thanks they got for it. None. It is a scummy record by these defendants. Here you have a volunteer ordered to pay $4,500. This blank order presented does not say that plaintiff had not been properly notified to appear. It cannot be signed. The devil sued St. Peter. St. Peter said, I don't see how you can win. All of the good people are up here. And the devil says, yeah but all of the judges are down here. Think of all that was said off the record in this dishonest court on March the 6th, 1995. Then we have the illegal pro se bias, the hatred of a pro se who stands on constitutional. to page 10.
constitutional rights and refuses to be ripped off by a liar. I, we're all connected. That's why they hate one reason, they hate process, okay? Because they aren't paying out law lawyers' fees. I, defendants clearly defaulted, not answering the complaint in 20 days, but corrupt court lets them get by with it. J, recuse. Judge Colabella should be disciplined, admonished, censured, removed. He doesn't observe the ethics standard, nor the high standards of conduct, just the high paycheck. They get over 100000 a year, these judges. And who pays them? You. He did not act in good faith, and he is accountable. He demonstrated prejudice, conflict of interest, flagrant disregard of fundamental rights, and displayed indifference to the judicial office. He abuses his power as a judge and elected official. A judge who is sworn to uphold the law should not fail to comply with his mandates. He abused his discretion for personal reasons. He should immediately vacate the ruling of March 6, 1995, to say nothing of September 9, 1994, and he should recuse himself. Judge Colabella did not rule on the merits. He decided facts a jury should have decided. No witnesses were sworn, no testimony was taken. There was no trial. There was no jury. Here are the things that a judge should be. This is the code, judicial conduct. Judge Colabella isn't one of those things. K, minutes, lies, misrepresentations to the court by Mallon and Purvis. Glendora did not say she didn't have to be there. I never said that, March the 6th, 1995. Near the, hear the audio tape. Judge Colabella always has been short on hearing the evidence. He let his buddies get by without discovery, manipulating the motions and conferences until he got them out of discovery. The audio tape was played on TV. Purvis has his courts mixed up. Glendora never monitored court in New Rochelle. This is worth 40. This is worth $200 an hour. Purvis is charging $200 an hour, and he isn't worth $2 an hour. And Colabella says that he will sign the order and make Glendora pay Purvis $4,500. Here's a lawyer not fully familiar with the facts and circumstances to say nothing of the law. Glendora was never asked to leave modern courts. She resigned. Glendora never was asked to leave because of making a disturbance in the court. This is a lie. The record of the minutes does not reflect that at 11.30 a.m. Glendora was called to go to a hearing at 2 p.m. Mallon lies. Hear the audio tape. Purvis in his account does not include the dumb call he made. He was the first to call, telling Glendora, you have two choices. Either withdraw the suit or fight it out in court. Now, isn't that a smart thing to say? Glendora said, put it in writing, Sonny. Purvis says, I'll report you. That's worth $200 an hour. That kind of an intelligence? That was the start of a cascade of perfect stupids. It was Purvis who called Glendora and asked for the time and channel. Glendora told him. Purvis lies that the basis of this lawsuit is that Glendora was asked to leave. There was no personal proof service to Glendora of any asked to leave. Glendora resigned. The basis of this lawsuit is Hubbard's contract with Glendora. You monitor the courts, write down what you see, and we'll publish a report. Glendora did her part of the agreement, 100 hours of labor and money spent on gas and parking. Hubbard, Beck, Mayapath, and Fund for Modern Course never did their part and never wrote a report. They lied as Purvis lies. This is reasonable, quote, unquote, at $200 an hour. An honest judge would not rule so. Some court reform association, the Fund for Modern Courts is, the association is a sham. It is a lie that Glendora's action is frivolous. What is frivolous is defendant's defense, quote, unquote. 
and Judge Colabella's decision order of September 9, 1994, and his ruling of March the 6th, 1995. Those are frivolous. Glendora's action is monumentally significant. You got these people, Beck, Mayapath, and Hubbard, the Fund for Ancient Courts masquerading as a court reform organization. Getting away with it. And somebody spends her own money and time standing up to them. That's frivolous. Before we get any further away from what is significant, read Glendora's complaint. Defendants, lawyer, court, act as if they never read it. She's purring, but she's sound asleep. We're up to page 20. Uh, Katie uh, going to sleep like that made me go to sleep. This is the next morning. I'm reading this to you on Saturday, uh, June 17. Now, what my complaint was, you know what my complaint was, because I read that it first came out way back in 1993. But the complaint essentially is, is that they made a deal. Uh, the Fund for Modern Course, Michelle Mayapath, Alan Beck, and Elizabeth Hubbard, they made a deal. You go out and you watch what's going on in the course, you write it down, you send it to us, and at the end of the monitoring period, we, the Fund for Modern Course, will write and publish a report. So we went out and we did all that work, maybe over a hundred hours. We spent all of our money on gasoline and posters and printing. They didn't even provide us with envelopes, they didn't provide us with stamps. Uh, so we put in all of our own money because we thought we were doing a good thing, monitoring the courts. And uh, then they didn't write the report, they didn't publish any report. They refused to put it in writing why, they refused to put it in writing that they did. So, if you know, it became increasingly clear that they were a sham. Uh, that they were being deceitful and devious. And uh, here they are, a court reform organization. And they defied all the court processes when it came to this lawsuit. And I asked them if they wanted to uh, settle the matter before it went to court but in their typical fashion, they just ignore it. That's what the issue is. And Colabella and Purvis and these crooked uh, defendants have covered up the issue. That's what it is. The front page of the minutes say that, say, Honorable Nicholas Colabella, Justice of the Supreme Court. Honorable stands for dishonorable. Did you know that? Honorable so-and-so is dishonorable. And JSC, Justice of the Supreme Court, no, JSC stands for Justice So Paul. M, on page two of the minutes, Judge Colabella does not say what the case is about. And here's what the case is about. A, Hubbard, Beck, Mayapath, and Pumpkin Modern Courts ask for volunteers. B, their deal was the volunteers monitors would monitor the course and write down what they saw and mail it in. Uh, Hubbard, Beck, Mayapath would have taken, uh, would take what the monitors wrote and publish a report. Glendora agreed to do that. Glendora did do that. She and husband Franklin spent over 100 hours monitoring courts and writing reports, dollars and dollars of gasoline, car wear, parking, postage, printing. We went out in the winter. Oh, that was a terrible winter. That was the worst winter we've had in memory for a long time. And we went all the way up to Peekskill and all that snow and cold. Uh, 
Hubbard, Beck, Mad Path, Bump, and Modern Courts did not send us envelopes, nor stamps, nor even forms. We had to print our own. They did not allow us what courts allow, 23 cents a mile. We paid our own. Then Hubbard, Beck, Mayor Path, and Fund for Modern Course refused to keep their end of the deal and publish the report. We had done all that work and spent all that money for nothing. They breached contract. We acted in good faith. They acted in bad faith. In addition, they refused to put in writing that they were not going to publish a report, nor why. They were devious, deceitful, dishonest, rude, and nasty. They kept hanging up. Lundora wrote up a complaint for court. Before filing it, she sent them a copy and asked them to settle this before it went to court. In their usual negligent fugitive style, they ignored it. So Lundora went ahead with the lawsuit November 9, 1993. They ignored that too. They defaulted. Lundora asked for default judgment, but got injustice instead of justice. Always in the West Justice Supreme Court, you get injustice instead of justice. Colabella's court, Thomas Mallon, Stephen Kellner, Raymond Powell, were outrageously rude to Glendora and Franklin, like Neanderthals. And when Glendora stood up for right and complained to Judges K. Trafficante, Malonis, and Gracia and recounted it on TV, they became bent on vindication, using the court as their weapon. Glendora demanded discovery, Hubbard, Beck, Mayapath, Fund for Modern Courts, the Court Reform Association ignored it. They defied the court. They ignored two discovery appointments for discovery set up by authority of the court. They failed to show up at three conferences. Glendora made every one. Colabella promised Glendora at the first conference, quote, I will see personally that the defendants will be here. Those were his very words to me at that conference. Came the next conference, but he went back on his word. Came the second conference, the fugitives were not there. His law clerk, Raymond Powell, had another. Had another plan and overruled Judge Colabella. Glendora asked why Judge Colabella had gone back on his word and he got, he got miffed. Then behind Glendora's back, the court began cooperating with uh, Purvis to get a motion to dismiss for summary judgment cancel conferences, and cancel discovery. Glendora knew she had been double-crossed, ex-party, and complained to Judges K, Trafficante, and Gracia, and on TV. Purvis's brief quote-unquote, as he called it, was infantile and full of lies. Glendora and Franklin spent 70 hours refuting every paragraph of it, 70 hours, and setting the record straight. But Judge Colabella never read a word. He didn't do his homework. Hubbard Beck may have passed fun from modern courts remembering a so-called court reform quote, unquote, association defaulted again. They never answered the cross motion. They filed no reply affidavit. They knew by now the spite and malice of Colabella, Powell, Mellon, and Kelman would overrule justice. And it did with the grotesque decision order of November 9, 1994, where the spite and malice were vented in, quote, frivolous, unquote, a huge lie, dismissed, quote, unquote, and cost, quote, unquote, and attorney's fees, quote, unquote. What more is there to throw at somebody? What more injustice can you find than that? The public is stripped of its courts, people. The public is stripped of its courts. All that remains is a pile of rubble. That's all that remains. We don't have any courts. We just have this pile of rubble. Then bungling Purgus, legal illiterate, asked for $4,500 attorney's fees, $200 per hour for 22 and a half hours, when his work product was closer to $2 per hour, if that. And remember that he is a friend, quote, unquote, of Hubbard. Glendora pointed out how bizarre this charge was. Colabella scheduled a hearing on November 30th, 1994 at TAP. That day, Glendora had an oral argument in the big time before three judges, Second Circuit, United States Court of Appeals. Perverted Purvis called Glendora on the phone and tried to get Glendora to give him some blank dates and he would arrange the hearing behind Judge Colabella's back. Glendora told the court she was furious with his going behind their back and asked the court to set up another hearing. December 1994, January 1995, and February 1995 went by with Colabella not scheduling the hearing. 
January 18, 1995, Colabella met Glendora in the lobby and ex parte asked her when she wanted to set up a hearing. I'm doing it. I'm doing it, he said. As the months rolled by, we thought he had dropped it. Then on March the 6th, 1995, Monday at 10.50 a.m., smart Alec Lee Thomas Mellon called and asked Glendora if she could go to a hearing, 2 p.m. that day, three hours later. Glendora reported his flip attitude and repartee on audio tape and played it for you on television. Glendora said no, that she was entitled to more notice than that, that this was no way to run a court. Glendora needed at least two weeks to review this 2,000-page case of bad record by defendants and of their lies and of their cover-up. March the 1995, April, May, and the first week of June go by, and Glendora hears nothing from Colabella, Hubbard, Mayapath, Fund for Modern Courts, Nobervis. We all thought they had dropped it. Then on June 10, 1995, Saturday, Glendora receives by ordinary mail with no proof of service, relying on Glendora's honesty. Wait a second. Relying on Glendora's honesty in contrast to the dishonesty of defendants saying no personal service, this bomb that there was a hearing March the 6th, 1995, that Colabella had made a unilateral decision with no hearing from the plaintiff, that corrupt Colabella had crookedly declared the grotesque $4,500 attorney's fee as reasonable and fair. The man is demented and that he would sign a judgment for the same on June the 21st, 1995, 10 a.m. Glendora had never been heard. It was the fall of Colabella. She had not been at the hearing. He had not given her proper notice. It was too short, and it was not in writing. Her civil rights had been denied. Her due process was violated, just as it had been all along. Since oath-breaking, Colabella went back on his word to, quote, personally see that the defendants are there, are here, quote, Remember, he said, I will personally see that the defendants will be here. And he went back on that word. In June 1994, and Glendora protested this double cross. And that is the story, A to Z, of a woman who volunteered with her husband to help a court reform association, which violated her rights. And this volunteer, who gave generously of her time, labor, and money to help out, is ordered by a corrupt court to pay out $4,500. Don't ever volunteer for the fund for modern courts. I hope they go out of existence. They're doing nothing. I don't know any court reform that they ever affected. We're doing more for court reform than they ever did. So here you are. I volunteer to help them out. I give them all that time. I give them all that money. And I end up being ordered to pay them $4,500. A volunteer is ordered to pay this association the volunteer volunteered for $4,500. The Colabella record shows how badly we need court reform. The Fund for Modern Courts also needs reform. Actually, it needs to go out of existence. Hubbard, Beck, and Mayapath are masqueraders. And the minutes. Glendora continues her scrutiny of the minutes, pages 3 to 13. Notice how quick, biased, Judge Colabella is to say it is not Purvis's fault. Did he say any such thing for Glendora? See, Purvis was uh, asked, could he come to a hearing? Purvis has said no. And so Colabella says, oh, well, that's all right. It's not his fault. When I was asked to come to a hearing and I said no, Colabella said nothing about that it wasn't my fault. It was not Glendora's fault she was not at the hearing. It was Judge Colabella's fault for not giving legal notice and notice in writing. The court was available for a hearing this afternoon, quote, unquote. But Glendora was not. It takes three, Judge Colabella, to make a hearing. Three. Can you count higher than two? Mr. Mallon was not put under oath. The rudeness and Neanderthal behavior of Mallon, uh, Kellner, and Powell disqualify them for court service, just as Judge Colabella is disqualified. Their animosity has rendered themselves useless to the court performance. Page four, line, nine, line 11. Mallon lies, Glendora hung up. She did not hung up, he hung up. The audio tape shows that clearly. 
quote, the hearing is going to be held with or without her, unquote, and Judge Cola Bella breaks the law. It takes three Judge Cola Bella to make a hearing. Go back and learn the law. Glendora could not make it. When Purvis earlier by Cola Bella's own admission could not make it, that was okay with Cola Bella. What is okay for one is okay for the other. And this ruling was unilateral and end illegal. Where do you go when judges break the law? Glendora is entitled to notice of 30 days or more. Glendora did not say she did not have to be there. Malice Mallon lies again. He is not fit to be working. Or is Colabella. And then Mallon says, quote, and I laughed and hung up on her. You believe that in a court? Westchester County Supreme Court? Kid stuff. Isn't that something to brag about? See paragraph 90. In addition to the infantile babbling of Purvis, we have to, we have the infantile babbling of Thomas Mallon. Glendora thought courts should be operated by grown-ups. Don't you? Page five, Cola Bella, quote, Glendora was told a hearing would occur at 2.30, quote. Glendora was told 2 p.m. Page five, notice how Cola Bella leads Purvis by his baby hand to do everything just the way Cola Bella wants it, manipulate it. Now, here are, this is what these minutes look like. See, and they charge five, I want you to look at this. They charge five dollars a page. They get one third on a page that anybody else would. See that? And this is five dollars a page. Rip off, court stenographers. Cola Bella, are you ready to proceed, Mr. Purvis? Purvis, I am ready, Your Honor. Cola Bella, it's now 2.45. Glendora was told a hearing would occur at 2.30. Well, Glendora has more right than that, Judge Cola Bella. Glendora has a right to a decent notice and a legal notice. So you're all wet there. If you are ready to proceed, I suggest we do the following, Cola Bella says to Purvis, leading him by his little baby hand, that you take the stand and be sworn in and then testify to what you deem to be the reasonable value of your services. Having been first, and Pur Edmund S. Purvis, having been first duly sworn, was examined and testified as follows. Leclerc, state your name, spell your last name and place of business. Purvis, Edmund S. Purvis, and my P-U-R-V-E-S, and my office is 1890 Palmer Avenue, Larchmont, New York. Stay away from there. It's Gail Ben Clifford and somebody else, and one of them isn't there anymore. Purvis, Mr. Purvis, I would, no, uh, Cola Bella, Mr. Purvis, I would suggest that you, in narrative form, set forth what you did and what you deem to be the reasonable value of your services. See how this is stacked? Purvis. Well, in November of 1931, about the end of a friend of mine, Elizabeth Hubbard, who is the director, executive director for the Fund for Modern Courts, called to say they had received several copies of a summons and complaint in the suit by Glendora against her, two other employees in the Fund for Modern Courts, allegedly for breach of contract. She said these had been served by mail and not personally. Now, we're on page 31. I just want you to see again uh, these minutes, look at all that blank space, look at that margin over here, look at it. Double space, look at the uh, double spacing of the name. Look at the top margin, look at the bottom margin, and we get soaked. Five dollars a page for that. Do we need court reform? Yes. Do we need modern courts? No. Ginny has joined us. Glendora. Meanwhile, Hubbard et al. had defaulted, but a crooked court lets them get by with their law breaking, and this is a so-called court reform association. No, quote, a friend of mine, unquote. Uh, isn't $4,500 a little hefty for a friend of mine? Glendora suspected this when the work of Purvis was so bad. It looked much more like a friend, folks, than it did any professional and $4,500, $200 an hour for that is scandalous. 
So I went in to see her after that, Purvis said. He went in to see Hubbard after that. I talked to her about it. I read through the file on Glendora, of which there is quite a bit of her reports and letters, and I prepared an answer, and within the time permitted, and service was by mail. Well, the time was not permitted. Glendora says, of which there is quite a bit, shows you how hard Glendora worked and all to be kicked around by these savages, Hubbard, Beck, Mayapath, and the Phony Court Reform Association. And it wasn't on time. Purvis, so when I served my answer, Glendora called, very upset, who said, I, Glendora, this is a lie. Glendora ne never did call Purvis and was upset. Glendora was not, uh, Glendora did not say that. Glendora did not call Purvis and Glendora did not say that. Purvis. Uh, and said I was time barred, my answer should be thrown out, and I told her, well, I think to simply to comply with the statute, you should serve all those named defendants personally. No such thing. Figment of his imagination, common terms, a lie. Clendor, this is all fictitious. It did not happen. Where is his proof on audio tape? And this is hearsay, Judge Colabella. How come Judge Colabella allows hearsay just because he habitually breaks the law. Judge Colabella is lying hearsay. Glendora isn't even present to be examined. And that's hearsay. This makes it hearsay. And that is against the law. Defendants never served Glendora personally with any of their papers. They relied on Glendora's honesty in the very area where they were dishonest. Hubbard, Beck, Mayapath, and the Fund for Modern Courts were fugitives of service, just as they were fugitives of discovery. Here we have a court reform association lying, dodging, and covering up. Purvis, prepared a set of interrogatories and served them on Glendora. I think it was the beginning of January of 1994, and I got back fairly shortly thereafter, as I remember, her answers to my infamous and improper interrogatories. Glendora, Purvis is too schoolboy to know that in a personal injury case, Discovery Article 31 CPLR says no interrogatories. A bill of particulars is the way. Now, is this worth $4,500, $200 per hour, Mr. Biased Judge Colabella? 99, at the top of his page 8 of the minutes, and the judge she has now is not fair and is not impartial. Purvis, I had to check to make sure we had all the facts straight that Glendora was only a volunteer for the Fund for Modern Courts. Oh, that, that takes a lot of checking, doesn't it? Oh, yeah, Purvis. And when her behavior at the various courts, she was monitoring, I think, the village of Port Chester and City Court in New Rochelle and one other. He's wrong about everything. I never monitored courts in New Rochelle. This is worth $200 an hour, $4,500. I never monitored courts in uh, New Rochelle. And he says one other. There were a whole lot other. There was Peekskill. There was Rye. There was the village of Port Chester and the Yonkers. This is worth $200 an hour, Judge Colabella. That she was asked to leave because she disrupted the proceedings by various questions she asked. And that, Glendora, Purvis never got any of the facts straight. A volunteer, a lot of thanks Glendora got for helping. Hubbard Beck Mayapath acted despicably. They were and are dehumanized. Uh, this is a lie. Glendora never monitored courts in No Rochelle. Is this worth $200 per hour? One other is a lie. Glendora monitored Peekskill. George Pataki's hometown, Rye, Port Chester, and Yonkers. That is what you call getting the facts straight. This is worth $200 per hour. Asked to leave what, muddled Purvis? She was never asked to leave a court. She was not asked to leave Fund for Modern Courts. She resigned. She never disrupted the proceedings of any court. This is a lie. What various questions she asked, where, when, of whom, does Judge Colabella?